Good evening. Yeah. Hi. Um, well, this is amazing. I mean, no one was expecting this turnout. Um, well, maybe we should have thought differently. Uh, JFK is in the news all day today. And um, I'm using this, I'm going to be using this occasion to make a plug for Morocco. Does it make a lot of sense? I know that a lot of historian buffs probably who are trying to make the connection between JFK and Morocco. Well, the only connection is a speaker. You know, Jeremy, <laughs> Jeremy Gunn flew uh, to, uh, to Maine from Morocco to give this talk, and he's going back because he lives in Morocco. He teaches at the Moroccan University, and uh, he uh, and his wife, uh, both are professors there. And so we are very grateful that he was able to come and accommodate uh, our request and uh, be present here tonight. So I hope you guys appreciate it. Secondly, I want to make a plug for the Center for Global Humanities. Uh, we have a lot of events like this at this center. Uh, they are always open and free to the public. Uh, the, we also have free receptions with good food and wine and beer and other stuff. And I, I really do hope that you continue to come to lectures like this, not just because it's JFK, but because uh, uh, because it's China or because a topic might be something related to communism even and other things. So all of it is interesting, which is, and we believe very firmly that these kinds of discussions, debates, forums keep our community alive, intellectually um, dynamic, and, um, and which maintains the spirit of democracy. So uh, the lecture tonight is, um, and my name is Anwar Majid, by the way, I'm the, I'm the director of the center. And I am being supported by a number of people here, uh, Liz Bennett, uh, George Young, uh, Dave Diego, Neil Jandro, uh, Janine, Laura Duff, and Eric Zulu, who is a professor teaching some of the students taking this class. Uh, Dr. Jeremy Gunn holds a PhD and a JD law, law degree, spent four years investigating the assassination of President John F. Kennedy for the US government. He served as the executive director and general counsel of the JFK Assassination Records Review Board from 1994 to 1998, an agency of the federal government that was responsible for collecting and declassifying U.S. government records about the assassination. He had rare access to individuals and records associated with the assassination. He's the only person to have taken sworn depositions of the doctors who performed the Kennedy autopsy as well as the physicians who treated President Kennedy at Parkland Memorial Hospital in Dallas. He interviewed directors of Central Intelligence and other figures in the CIA, FBI, NSA, and military intelligence, including the person identified as Mr. X, uh, uh, Donald Sutherland in the Oliver Stone film, JFK. His top secret SCI clearance gave him access to all of the sensitive records related to the assassination. The evidence collected included many surprises not previously known. And just as we are celebrating this event today, talking about this event today, the Canadian uh, broadcasting company, CBC, uh, will be airing a program at 9 p.m. Uh, on the very same subject tonight. So please help me welcome Professor Jeremy Gunn. Thank you very much, Anwar. It's a uh, pleasure to be here, even though the circumstances obviously are not uh, the ideal uh, circumstance. The Kennedy assassination, of course, uh, is one of the most uh, dramatic and traumatic events that's happened uh, in American history during the last 50 years. Uh, people will liken it to, uh, to either Pearl Harbor, to the attacks of September 11th. So it's something that draws uh, people's attention, and it's something that's uh, uh, appropriate, I think, to focus on, uh, not only for the question about uh, the, the murder mystery, and I think that it is a murder uh, mystery, but also the question of what can we really know about history and what can we really know. Uh, the Kennedy assassination is one of those events, probably the most documented event, if we think of this as being something that took place in six seconds in Dallas, and the number of records that have been generated related to this, uh, extremely highly documented, but in many ways we don't know exactly uh, what it was that uh, happened. 
the, the assassination itself is a very complicated story. There are numerous avenues that uh, we could talk about uh, this evening, whether it is uh, the autopsy that took place in, uh, talk, took place, uh, in uh, Bethesda Naval Hospital uh, in just outside of Washington, whether it is the trip that Lee Harvey Oswald took to Mexico City about seven weeks before the assassination, where he went inside the Cuban embassy, inside the Soviet embassy. Uh, those two embassies were under extremely heavy surveillance by the CIA. Uh, so there we have this person, this uh, lone nut, who goes right through the heart of American intelligence seven weeks before the assassination. Uh, one of the people he meets with in the Soviet embassy is a person named Kostikov, who was the director of uh, Department 13 for the KGB in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, that's the department of the KGB that handles assassinations. So there's Lee Harvey Oswald meeting with the head of assassinations of the KGB in Mexico City seven weeks before the assassination under the surveillance of uh, the Central Intelligence Agency. There are a lot of other aspects of the story. Uh, if we were to go into any single one of them, then we would have to leave the others. Uh, what I'm going to do is try and talk about some of the uh, very basic uh, elements of this, give you a little bit of my perspective on this issue, and then I'll try and leave it open for questions so that if there's a particular aspect uh, that you want to go into, uh, we can then uh, talk, about, uh, talk about that. Uh, of course, the big question in the Kennedy assassination is who shot President uh, Kennedy? I think I've been asked that question well, I, won't, I don't know how many times, but that, that is always the question that I uh, am asked after, after uh, it's learned that I had some involvement in uh, the, the government uh, inquiry uh, between 1994 and 1998. Uh, of course, the, there is the official version of the assassination, which is, was published by the Warren Commission, released on uh, September 24th of uh, 19. Uh, 64. So immediately after the assassination, two or three days after the assassination, President Lyndon Johnson apported, appointed a blue ribbon commission to look into the assassination. And after uh, a few months worth of work, um, 10 months, 11 months uh, worth of work into the assassination, they explained to the American people what they thought had uh, happened. Uh, this version, the Warren Commission version, is now known as something like the official uh, history, the official story. Uh, so let me just recount very briefly what that is, then we'll talk a little bit about uh, that. The Warren Commission concluded that President Kennedy had been shot by a lone gunman named Lee Harvey Oswald. Uh, they believed that Oswald uh, shot President Kennedy uh, shot at President Kennedy three times. Uh, the first uh, shot missed completely, hit a curb, a chip from the curb went up and hit a uh, bystander, so that's shot number one. Shot number two is the one that's called the, is referred to as the magic bullet uh, version, and according to the Warren Commission, the second shot uh, by Lee Harvey Oswald uh, entered Kennedy's I don't know whether to say back or neck, uh, be third thoracic vertebrae. Uh, the Warren Commission describes it as the neck. Uh, that's, not a, that's not a medical term. Uh, back is not a medical term. Third thoracic vertebrae is a medical term. But this became one of the controversial issues. Is Kennedy shot in the neck or is he shot uh, in the back? Uh, so according to the Warren Commission, the first bullet entered the back of the neck uh, exited from the throat, went into the back of, the, of Governor uh, John Connolly, sitting in front of uh, President uh, Kennedy, uh, goes in his back, breaks a rib, comes out an inch below his uh, right nipple, uh, then goes into his right wrist, exits through his right wrist, and is lodged in his left uh, uh, thigh. Uh, that would make penetrating skin seven different times, uh, transiting Kennedy's body, uh, Connolly's body, twice through Connolly's body. 
Uh, and for the, the commission's uh, version of this, there is, the, there is a bullet that performed all of this, which is cynically called the magic bullet. Um, it's a, uh, the, I guess more technical is Commission Exhibit 399 uh, by the Warren Commission. Uh, it is very slightly indented, um, and, but it is believed by the Warren Commission that this one bullet did all of this uh, damage. Incidentally, the FBI tried to replicate this by shooting the very same rifle, same uh, type of ammunition through a goat carcass, through a human cadaver, and in every time uh, the bullet was completely fragmented. Um, and so uh, we have this one bullet, uh, again the magic bullet, uh, and we could raise the question, even if one bullet could do all this damage, is that bullet in fact the one that is commission exhibit? Uh, 399. Uh, the, uh, when when uh, the Warren Commission tried to uh, uh, shoot another bullet in, in addition to uh, the goat carcass and a human uh, cadaver, the only two bullets they could get that would resemble the damage to Commission Exhibit 399 was shot into water and cotton. Uh, in other words, the bullet was uh, not consistent with something that would have gone through uh, human flesh. But that then is the linchpin of the Warren Commission uh, story. The third shot uh, at, in, in Dealey Plaza was one that, uh, according to the Warren Commission, uh, hit Kennedy in the head and was the, fatal, uh, was the fatal wound. So three shots, the first one missed, the second two shots. Uh, uh, caused severe damage but not, but not fatal injuries and the third shot was the fatal injury. The Warren Commission said that all three shots came from the sixth floor of the uh, Texas School Book Depository behind the President's uh, motorcade at the time of the shooting. And the Warren Commission concluded that the assassination weapon was a World War II surplus weapon. Uh, the Warren Commission called it the Manlicher Carcano, uh, 6.5 millimeter uh, bolt action uh, rifle. A more t correct way of referring to it would be just a uh, Carcano. Uh, it was a rifle that was not known for its accuracy, uh, I guess, in all of the attempts to shoot it other than during the assassination of President Kennedy where it was, uh, again, according to the Warren Commission, uh, extremely uh, accurate. This version of the Warren Commission, uh, published in September of 1964, was officially accepted by President Lyndon Johnson, officially accepted by the Kennedy family to the extent that they uh, commented on it. In fact, Lyndon Johnson did not believe the Warren Commission report, though he never said so uh, publicly to his uh, colleagues, to his uh, friends. He believed that President Kennedy was assassinated uh, indirectly by uh, Fidel Castro. This official version in the Warren Commission report uh, was accepted by uh, the major media in the United States, the New York Times, the Washington Post, CBS, NBC, uh, Time Life, uh, and it is still, uh, to some extent, the accepted uh, version uh, uh, that is uh, widely believed, I think, particularly by the intellectual elite uh, in the United States. Those people who are sober and not prone to conspiracies will believe uh, that particular uh, version. Uh, and, and for many people, the uh, official version is really the only sensible version, and any other uh, attempt to explain the assassination is uh, uh, capable of being termed as uh, something that would be promoted by people with mental weaknesses or conspiratorial uh, mentalities. Now, of course, there are many people who dispute the findings of the Warren Commission. Um, most of the books that are published on this, most of the people whom you hear uh, talk about this will be advancing a different version of uh, the conspiracy, and they are a different version of the assassination. Uh, some people will say that the Warren Commission had serious flaws in its investigation and, and might stop there. Others will say, no, this is simply a conspiracy to assassinate the president, and the Warren Commission and major media in the United States 
uh, have attempted uh, to cover that up. Now, we have, in one sense, the, the principal alternative question, or the question that uh, if we are concerned about what really happened in Dealey Plaza, the big question, it's not the only question, but the big question is, was there a shooter who shot President Kennedy from the front? So this is associated with the grassy knoll and a picket fence behind the grassy knoll. So it's, was there a shooter there? And of course, if there was a shooter there, whether that shooter was successful or not, there was a conspiracy to assassinate the president. Now, if there was no shooter from the front, that doesn't mean that there wasn't a conspiracy, but that's really where the big question is, is there a shooter uh, from the front? And again, if there was, then we definitely have uh, a conspiracy. Now, many people who were in Dealey Plaza on November 22nd, 12.30 p.m., uh, believed that there was a shooter from the front. So these are the, you either call them eyewitness or ear, ear witness uh, testimony. So uh, I've heard numbers of up to 50 people believe that there was shooting uh, from the front of the president uh, and behind the picket fence. And some people believe that they saw smoke. Some people believe they saw the flash of a, uh, a flash of a gun. Uh, that uh, story is, I mean, whether that is true or not is, uh, to some extent difficult to uh, know based upon the testimony of witnesses. There are echoes in Dealey Plaza. Uh, it would be difficult to know from which direction uh, shots uh, came. Uh, so people might well have thought that. That doesn't mean that it's uh, true. But there certainly were witnesses in Dealey Plaza who believed that President Kennedy had been shot from the front. It's not only the witnesses in Dealey Plaza who thought Kennedy had been uh, shot from the front, but the doctors who treated President Kennedy at Parkland Memorial Hospital uh, believed initially, and let me underscore initially, many of them changed their uh, point of view afterwards, they initially believed that Kennedy had been shot from the front, uh, and that there were two signs of shooting from the front. One of them was a bullet wound that they believe to be an entrance wound in the front of the neck, near the Adam's apple. So doctors treating President Kennedy at Parkland Hospital believe that there was an entry wound in the throat. Uh, so that, that was one. The second uh, set of observations was that uh, on President Kennedy's head, uh, from behind in the region called the occipital parietal. So I will, it's difficult to say occipital parietal without touching the back of your head uh, there. So the occipital parietal region, uh, three doctors who treated President Kennedy uh, at Parkland Memorial Hospital, including neurologists, uh, believed that there had been an entry wound somewhere in the front of President Kennedy's body, and this massive wound in the occipital parietal area was an exit wound. So both the wound to the throat and in the back of the head, both would suggest President Kennedy had been shot from the front. Now, that, not that he had not been shot from behind as well, but those two wounds were thought of as being uh, uh, both uh, sh shots from the front. Uh, if you, don't, if you are one of those happy people who do not uh, know that for bullet wounds, uh, typically it is a small entry wound and a large exit wound. So if you were living in happy ignorance before I said that, you are now uh, living with the uh, rest of us. So a large exit wound in the occipital parietal area consistent with a shot uh, from uh, behind. But were the Dallas doctors correct? Were the people who thought there was shooting on the grassy knoll correct or not correct? In, uh, there are two uh, additional pieces of, well, there are many more, but two additional things we need to uh, look at. Uh, first, w just as eyewitnesses are not entirely reliable uh, witnesses, they can think that they saw something and didn't. I personally have some memories of things that I thought that I saw or observed that I later learned I could not possibly have seen them, though I still have the memory. I mean, people can be mistaken in eyewitness uh, testimony. Uh, but, um, uh, and the doctors who treat, pre doctors who treat 
uh, people in uh, emergency situations. Their job is not to determine what's the entry wound or the exit wound or the cause of death. Their job is to keep the patient alive and to try to, uh, try to uh, cure the patient, patient or at least keep the patient alive. Uh, so their job is not to determine this. And uh, some studies that I read uh, years ago would say that uh, treating physicians are often very incorrect in their original uh, explanations of what happened. Not that they're bad, not that they're involved in a conspiracy or cover-up, but just that's not their uh, job. So we can ask the question, were the Parkland doctors correct in their initial impression, and were the uh, witnesses in Dealey Plaza who thought there was shooting from the front, were they correct? Well, the two best pieces of evidence that we have, in my opinion, for the Kennedy assassination on this question are is the autopsy that was performed at uh, Bethesda Naval Hospital. That was the job of the forensic pathologists, or at least we'll say the pathologists, uh, um, the job of the pathologist is to determine what was the cause of death, what is the entry wound and the exit wound. And the other, this remarkable film that we have, the Zapruder film, uh, that was that filmed the exact moment when President Kennedy was shot in the head uh, and the fatal wound. I think that we can say, uh, as of, uh, and it's, we see this in uh, fil in uh, 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 frame uh, 313. We see the the massive head wound uh, to the president. Uh, president Kennedy was alive in. Uh, frame 312, and for all practical purposes, he was dead uh, by the end of film, uh, frame 313. Uh, some of his bodily organs may have continued to function, but he was, for practical purposes, death, uh, dead. So we have a film that shows exactly the moment of death. So the autopsy report by the uh, doctors in uh, Bethesda and the Zapruder film should help explain were the doctors and were the observers in Dealey Plaza correct or not. Uh, Abe Zapruder was uh, just a, uh, filming a home movie, eight millimeter, very small uh, little uh, frame, so it's a, it's a tiny, uh, tiny camera. Uh, so he's, he films this. Uh, the following day, so he films it on November 22nd, the following day he sells the film, the original film, to Life Magazine for $150,000. Uh, and so the, per, the entity that came into possession of the film by the morning of November 23rd was Life Magazine. And it's one thing that it's worth noting is Life Magazine possessed, controlled, owned the original film from uh, the morning of November 23rd until the Assassination Records Review Board, for which I worked, uh, ordered that the film be seized by the U.S. government under eminent domain. The, the, uh, the Life magazine was paid for uh, this, uh, so the, uh, it was paid for, but it, that film is now in the National Archives in the United States, so it's part of you are all owners of the uh, Zapruder film uh, now. The film itself, uh, Life magazine, published in December of 1963, some of the frames from the Zapruder film. They did not include uh, the famous uh, film or frame 313 that showed uh, the wound, believing that it was too uh, grotesque to be seen uh, by the public. The Warren Commission published some of the frames of the film in its report in 1964. Uh, the first time that the film was actually seen in public uh, was in 1969 in the trial that Jim Garrison brought in New Orleans, the, the trial against uh, Clay Shaw. So that was the first time he subpoenaed. It was not the original film that was shown, but a duplicate of the film. That's the first time the film uh, was uh, seen. The first time it was seen by the general public in the United States was in 1975 in a television uh, program with the important and serious journalist Geraldo Rivera. <laughs> so what does the Zapruder film show? 
Uh, it's very controversial what it shows and what it doesn't show. Some will even claim that the Zapruder film has been uh, doctored and we're not seeing the original uh, of that. But what does the Zapruder film show? I've spoken with people who, as I'm watching the film with them, and they'll say, see, there, that's when it happened. And I look at it and I don't see uh, what they're talking about. When Kennedy is first hit, when Governor Connolly is first hit, there are many different interpretations. When was Kennedy first hit? When was Connolly first hit? Now for frame 313, there's no question that was the fatal shot. But in terms of other shots or what it means, was there more than one shooter or not? Very controversial. There's one thing that is not controversial in the Zapruder film. And that is, after President Kennedy is hit in film, in frame 313, his body goes immediately back and to the left. Uh, so that's not controversial. After he is shot, he goes back and to the left. Now, if we're thinking about our simple way of thinking about things, and I'm very simple, so this is how I do think about uh, things, that would seem to be consistent with a shot from the front. So it comes and hits and it will continue to go in the same direction. Now, that does not necessarily mean that it happened, and I'm saying that this is the simple uh, way of thinking of it, but Kennedy's body going back and to the left would be, at least in a uh, reasonably simple way, uh, that would be consistent with a shot from the front. If you were thinking that Kennedy had been shot from behind, presumably his body would go uh, towards uh, the front. So we have now, we've got the Zapruder film. We see something very clearly in this. But what was the American public told in 1963 about what the Zapruder film showed with regard to the direction of President Kennedy's body after the shooting? So. Uh, we know, because we can watch the film, that his body goes back and to the left. The first description of the film uh, that was made in night, was in, from November of 1963 by a young cub reporter, you may have heard of him, named Dan Rather. So he happens to be in Dallas, and he sees the Zapruder film. And he describes the Zapruder film uh, with remarkable accuracy. I couldn't believe it when I first heard this his description, including describing the expression on Jackie Kennedy's face. I don't know how he was able to do that. If I had had the frames just in front of me and looking at them individually, I couldn't have done a better description than did Dan Rather, with one exception. And he describes President Kennedy's body after being hit as going forward. So. Dan Rather, who has seen the film, very accurate description, except for on this one point. OK, so that's one. Now people can make mistakes. I make mistakes. I assume some of you make mistakes. So uh, maybe Dan Rather made a mistake, got some things right and some things incorrect. Here's one I have a little bit more difficulty accounting for. Remember, Life magazine owns the original Zapruder film. And on December 6th, 1963, I have a copy of the, a photocopy of the article here, uh, Life Magazine wants to talk about what happened in Dealey Plaza. And Life Magazine says there are already starting to be conspiracy theories about President Kennedy being shot from the front. And Life Magazine, in this article, says, well, yes, we understand the Dallas doctors did think that President Kennedy was shot from the front. Uh, and they said, we at Life Magazine didn't understand uh, how could Kennedy have been shot from the front, as the Dallas doctors thought, if Oswald's behind? So they said, this is a good question. So Life Magazine went to look at the film itself to see what actually happened. And so from Life Magazine, remember, they have the original film. The American public does not have it. Uh, it says, it has been hard to understand how the bullet could enter the front of, front of his throat if Oswald is behind. Hence the recurring guess that there was a second sniper somewhere else. That is the grassy knoll behind the picket fence. Um, uh, 
but the eight millimeter film shows the president turning his body far around to the right as he waves to someone in the crowd. His throat is exposed toward the sniper's nest just before he clutches it. So we, Life Magazine, we have the only original record of the assassination. President Kennedy turned around, and when he turned around, that's when he was shot. So if you read Life Magazine, if you believe that reporters are telling the truth, that they have observed this record, which they have, I think that makes sense. Well, in 1969, when the film was first able to be seen by the public, this is again in the Garrison trial, it turns out President Kennedy never turned around to look behind. So how do you account for this now? Dan Rather, very accurate description, except for this one thing on the question of which direction the shot comes from. Life magazine has the film. They understand the issue exactly. Was Kennedy shot from the front? and they either make an extraordinarily stupid mistake or they lie about this so the American public knows. In 1964, some of the frames of the Zapruder film are included in the Warren Commission report. On the question of the direction that the president's body went after the shooting, the Warren Commission report inverted the frames so it looked as though his body went forward rather than back. So the frames were inverted. So you're a conscientious person, you're reading the news, you're trusting in the Warren Commission, you're trusting in Dan Rather, everybody trusts Dan Rather, right? I think I'm right about that. Uh, you trust Life Magazine, uh, and we've got the, this rather consistent set of mistakes on exactly the same issue, on exactly the important issue in the Kennedy assassination, was there a shooter from the front? Uh, when it was point, after the film became available publicly, the uh, Warren Commission was asked, or former members of the Warren Commission were asked about this. The FBI ended up reporting that it was an inadvertent printer's error that the, the order of the films were, uh, were uh, switched. So that's our Zapruder film, uh, raises some uh, questions about this. Now, with the information that I'm giving you now, that doesn't necessarily prove anything, uh, but it certainly does suggest that people were certainly aware of what the issue was, was President Kennedy shot from the front, and all of the official information going to the American public is attempting to deny that, even when there is information uh, showing that that was not the case. So what about the autopsy? Now, that's really the for uh, an assassination investigation or any murder investigation. That's probably the single most important uh, set of evidence that you have. Not always, but uh, typically that's the case. Now, the doctors who uh, performed the autopsy, uh, there were three doctors responsible for the autopsy. I took their depositions under oath in the National Archives. Uh, this was the first time that they had had a systematic deposition taken, so there's a legal inquiry, there's a court stenographer uh, there. The original autopsy material is in front of them. This is the first time they have ever seen the original autopsy material in terms of uh, the, the face sheet, the, the record, uh, since the time of the assassination. It was the first time they had ever seen the autopsy photos. So they were present when the photos were taken, but they had not been shown uh, the photos uh, before. The doctors who performed uh, the autopsy believed and claimed that President Kennedy had been shot from behind, and the version that the, uh, the uh, doctors in, uh, in Bethesda Hospital gave was exactly the same as the Warren Commission, supported the, uh, the Warren Commission. There are, some, there are a few little problems here that we need to ask some uh, questions about, uh, and there, there, are more than, there are more than a few, but I'll just uh, mention two of them. When I took the, the deposition of Dr. Humes under oath, uh, I went through uh, the record uh, fairly systematically uh, with him, and uh, we finally got to the question of the original autopsy. So there's a version of the autopsy that is in the National Archives, handwritten. He had very good handwriting. I envied his uh, handwriting. So he has this original version of the autopsy. I asked him a series of questions, because I had some suspicions, and he admitted under oath for the first time 
that the version that is in the National Archives, the original version, was not the original version. He had written another one beforehand, and he had burned the original version. He never told the Warren Commission. He had never told the American public that. He admitted that under oath. I said, why did you burn it? Uh, I did not think for a minute I would get a correct answer, but he said the president's blood was on it, and I thought it was gruesome, and I asked him, I already asked him, but I reminded him that he said that he wrote the autopsy while he was at home sitting in front of his fireplace. So I said, was there president's blood in your home, uh, knowing that it couldn't possibly be? And then he acknowledged that that could not have been the reason, but he could not remember why he had uh, burned the original version and said nothing to uh, anybody uh, about that. The autopsy photos that are in the National Archives do not show a large, massive exit wound in the occipital parietal area. See, I can't say it without touching uh, the back of my head. I've tried, and it just, I can't do it. Uh, uh, there's no massive wound in the occipital parietal area that's visible on the photos. So one of the questions is, were these photos doctored? Are the photos accurate? Are the doctors in Parkland Hospital correct or incorrect? So all of these questions uh, came up. We were able, the, the, the agency that I worked for, we were able to find the person who developed the original autopsy photo. So her names were on the records, and we found her, her name was Sandra Spencer. Uh, so we located her, and we brought her to Washington. Uh, so what she did was she developed the films. So these were slides. Uh, there were black and white slides and color slides. These are large formats, so large uh, prints. So these are not your 35 millimeter uh, prints, but these are large prints. So she develops the color transparencies, black and white transparencies, and then she printed from the transparencies onto Kodak paper. I asked her if she had any uh, prints that she had made at the same time that she developed the autopsy photos and printed the autopsy photos, and she said yes, uh, because she was she did the um, the um, the developing work for the White House, and she had pictures of President Kennedy that had been taken a couple of days earlier that she kept as a souvenir. So I said, bring those with you, because in theory, the paper that is in the National Archives that the photographs are printed on should be exactly the same as what she had. So she came to the National Archives. She looked at the autopsy photos, the color transparencies, the black and white transparencies, and she said, these are not the photographs that I developed myself. And I said, well, could you describe what is different about these? And she said, yes. Uh, she said that the photographs that she developed had a large exit, massive exit wound in the back of the head. So what she said she developed was exactly the same as what the doctors in Parkland Hospital had seen, consistent once again with a shot from the front uh, not from behind. We then compared the paper of the photographs that she had developed, and the paper in the National Archives is not the paper, uh, the, photo, uh, the, uh, the polar, or the uh, Kodak, sorry about that mistake, but not the Kodak paper that she had, and she said, I, these, are not, these are not the ones that I did. She said, I don't know where they came from, uh, but these are not mine. So I asked her uh, if she had had any experience with autopsies before, and I thought, Presumably she had not, and she may not know what she's been seeing. We wanted to do comprehensive, not jump to uh, conclusions. And so I was expecting her to say no. She'd done uh, uh, photographs of President Kennedy, but not autopsy. And she said, oh, yes, before I went to work at the uh, Naval Lab in Anacostia, I was an autopsy photographer myself. And so she was very familiar um, with that. So we have a few questions there. Now, none of this says that we uh, know what the answers to those questions are, but we do have some uh, questions with this. The agency that I worked for, the Assassination Records Review Board, was created by federal statute in 1992. It was created immediately after the film uh, by Oliver Stone called JFK. So the film was released in December of 1991. The very last scene on the film is saying, I don't remember what the numbers were, but there are several thousand or tens of thousands of US government records that are 
uh, in the National Archives and in the agencies that have not been released to the public. So Congressman Louis Stokes watched the film with his daughter. This is according to what Louis Stokes told me. He was watching the film with his daughter, and his daughter said after the film, Daddy, why don't you do something about that? And so Daddy Congressman Stokes uh, enacted a law that created the Assassination Records Review Board. The responsibility of our agency was to identify assassination records throughout the US government, whether in the CIA or the FBI or ONI or State Department, Na National Security Agency, if I didn't say that, the whole gamut of records, if they're related to the assassination, to identify them and get them in the assassination uh, records collection. Second task was to declassify those records so that they would be available for the American uh, public. Then also we were supposed to look for records that were in private hands. And one of the set of records that we had, I don't know whether we call it private or not, were the Jim Garrison uh, records from, uh, from New Orleans. Uh, the, the, the district attorney at that time was Harry Connick uh, Sr., uh, who from what I understand is closely related to Harry Connick Jr. Um, so Harry Connick Sr. Uh, first said that he would give us the records, then he changed his mind, then we started a lawsuit and he ended up giving us uh, the records. So we did get some records that were not federal government records and we went through a massive process of declassifying those records. Those records are now uh, available at the National Archives and a lot of them are available online now so you can see them yourselves. Uh, what we attempted to do was to declassify them to the greatest extent possible. Uh, some things are still uh, classified, but we had sort of a, a, a scale that if it was information immediately and directly related to the assassination of President Kennedy, uh, that those records would be released in full in their entirety. Now, there was no such record, but if there had been a CIA officer who was implicated in the assassination, uh, that name would have been released. There were people whose names in the record had very little to do with the assassination itself. Sometimes we'd have records such as a presidential briefing where topics from the entire gamut of what the president is briefed on are included in the record, but only one paragraph is on the assassination. We also had records where uh, the, some things were rather unimportant, and what we did uh, was to say that the postponement of the release of these records will continue until the year 2017, which I thought, well, that's going to be a long time from now. That's after we're all dead. Uh, now it's coming up. I was asked when I was interviewed uh, last week, will I be very interested in seeing these last records and what they show about the Kennedy assassination? Uh, so now we'll finally get it in 2017. I said, I've already seen those records. There isn't anything uh, in there that I can identify. So in some ways, uh, the story of what is available in federal government records is for all practical purposes revealed. There are some records that we've learned about uh, subsequently, uh, parts of the story that we didn't know, uh, that there are still efforts to try to release them. Uh, I'm not expecting that there will be anything that will help answer the question of uh, what really happened in uh, what really happened in Dealey Plaza. So uh, I'm expecting we will continue to learn additional things in the future, but I'm not expecting any uh, major revelations. And in terms of what I saw, there. Uh, don't wait till 2017 to learn the truth. Uh, uh, it's not going to, uh, it's not going to uh, be there. Uh, let me uh, uh, just say a couple of things, uh, and then, then we can open this for uh, questions. And again, uh, there are several different aspects of this story that I would like to talk about, but uh, we, again, we don't have time. When it comes to the conspiracy theory, uh, there are well, there are several different conspiracy theories that are out there. Let me just identify uh, them for you. There is the U.S. government involvement, and this could be uh, the CIA, the FBI, uh, military intelligence, uh, and, and uh, many will say LBJ was involved in this. And these can be conspiracies of involving the U.S. government. Uh, that can be. Uh, the rogue elements in CIA are responsible for this, or this is a deliberate decision of U.S. agencies. Uh, from all of the records that I have seen, and 
uh, when I started, I wanted to find the smoking gun. I wanted to find this. I wanted to solve the assassination. So I was ready to, uh, ready to uh, solve this. From what I've seen in the records, there is no direct evidence of any U.S. government prior knowledge of the assassination. There's no record of any uh, element of the U direct evidence of any element of the U.S. government being involved. Now, of course, theoretically, that you might be involved in doing this and you don't leave any records to show that. So the absence of records does not mean uh, the absence of uh, reality. Um, but there isn't any evidence that I've seen that would support that, and I'm uh, quite suspicious of theories that will go in that direction. And those, those are major parts of the uh, theory. Uh, second one is the mafia uh, was involved in this. Uh, and the mafia story uh, is, a, is a complicated story. Uh, the Attorney General of the United States, Bobby Kennedy, was actively going after the mafia. Uh, the mafia, of course, we think does not have scruples about, well, we don't want to shoot somebody. Uh, so the mafia might well have been uh, involved. And there, it, there are stories, circumstantial evidence that can implicate directly or indirectly uh, Johnny Rosselli, Sam Giancana, Carlos Marcello. And we also need to remember the person who shot Lee Harvey Oswald uh, was Jack Ruby. Uh, the attempt is made to say Jack Ruby is part of the mafia. Well, that's sort of stretching things. It's true he ran a strip club, and it's true that strip clubs were uh, largely operated by the mafia, but that hardly makes Jack Ruby uh, a major uh, mafia figure. But certainly there are uh, mob ties. Third story, and each of these has many different subplots to them as well. But the third one is anti-Castro uh, Cubans. And the anti people who wanted to get rid of Castro, who believed that Kennedy had been uh, insufficiently focused on getting rid of Castro, I guess if they had only known, they would have known that there was in fact a, an operation, Operation Mongoose, being run by Bobby Kennedy to assassinate Castro, and that many attempts had been made to assassinate uh, Castro. That not, was not widely known by the American uh, public. Uh, what Lyndon, this is where Lyndon Johnson thought this happened. Well, uh, not the anti-Castro Cubans, but that Cuba had been involved. Not only the anti-Castro Cubans, but a separate theory is the pro-Castro Cubans. And this is the one that Lyndon Johnson believed in. So Johnson said in his uh, uh, very polite uh, Texas accent, uh, Kennedy was running a goddamn murder ink down in, uh, in Cuba. Uh, Kennedy tried to kill Castro, but Castro got Kennedy first. That seems to have been the opinion of uh, Lyndon uh, Johnson. So it was Castro behind the assassination. Johnson was extremely concerned that uh, many Americans would believe what he believed personally, that Castro was behind this uh, directly or uh, indirectly, and that if Americans believed Castro was responsible, that might lead toward a United States invasion to overthrow uh, Castro. So Johnson wanted to suppress that, and he attempted to convince members of the Warren Commission to join because of exactly that concern. So Johnson's concern there was not getting to the truth, the concern was getting that issue uh, dealt with. Uh, the last uh, assassination uh, conspiracy theory is the right-wing extremists, uh, one including uh, Joseph Mil Miltier uh, and then some associated with uh, Dallas. Some people will say that it, the Warren Commission is involved in this conspiracy. Some people will say the Warren Commission simply was incompetent. One of the conclusions that I reach, and this is where I will end, is although I do not myself believe that the Warren Commission was consciously involved in an attempt to suppress the truth about the assassination, again, personal point of view, I believe that they, con they did a profound disservice to the American people, that they did not conduct a serious, comprehensive, conscientious investigation of the assassination, which they could have done in 1964 and I couldn't do in 1994. Uh, 
So they did not do it. They, cre they created what I think was a prosecutor's brief against Oswald. Any evidence they could find that uh, was incriminatory against Oswald, they would include things that were exculpatory, they left out of the report. So they did a profound uh, disservice uh, and led to, I think, uh, giving life to many of the uh, conspiracy uh, theories. With that, let's try your questions. <clears throat> Thank you. There will be microphones on both, uh, both aisles, so do not ask a question if you don't have a microphone in your hand. Okay. Thank or you. a question that I don't know the answer to. Okay. <laughs> so there's a microphone here and there's a microphone there. Okay. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. I'm astounded when you watch all this information that's been coming out over the past several weeks leading up to the anniversary uh, today. Um, well, the level of forensic and level of forensic pathology that poor in 1963, and what you would expect that a police department of the supposed caliber of Dallas would have a forensic unit that would be more capable of looking into this, which raises some of the questions in the conspiracy theory that the body was actually removed and rushed out, some people say in respect to the First Lady, the family, and the American public. But you would think that a good forensic team would have intervened. I guess the question number one is, was the level of forensic pathology in 1963 that poor? Oh, the, the answer to that is no. And in fact, the person who uh, was the forensic pathologist in Dallas was Earl Rose, who is one of the best in the country. And when uh, and the, 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 the autopsy that was performed in a Bethesda Naval Hospital was a disgrace. Uh, it, I mean, it, it was a disgrace. Uh, when, I, when I took the deposition, I asked uh, Dr. Humes what the standard was that he used for the autopsy. And he said, oh, there was some manual that had been created by the Navy that set up the standards. And I said, is that the one that you followed? And he said, yes. And I then pulled out a copy of it, which I had, and handed it. And I said, is this the one that you followed? And uh, he didn't say anything. Well, he said, yeah, he answered yes to that. But I could tell, I mean, from my perspective, uh, he thought this is going to be a very bad day. Uh, and we then went through this, and he just simply didn't follow the procedures. So very good, one of the best in the country in Dallas who wanted to perform uh, the autopsy but was not allowed to do it. And then you had uh, two of the three people uh, were not forensic pathologists. Uh, not capable of doing it. One of them, uh, Pierre Fink, was a forensic pathologist, but he was not the one uh, who was running uh, the show. So it's not a lack of ability at the time. Uh, it was something else. In terms of what was happening in Dallas, uh, I am to some extent sympathetic uh, with, uh, with what happened. So President Johnson is there. The First Lady is there. Uh, Governor Connolly has been shot. At that point, Nobody knows really what's happening. Is this the beginning? And, and Johnson was under, had been briefed that one of the ways that you start World War III is by attempting to assassinate the president. So not that the Soviet Union had been on alert or anything, but just you have to be very careful. And you think, OK, here we are in Dallas. Uh, Kennedy is shot in Dallas. Do we want to turn over the investigation to Dallas? And I would think, no, probably you don't. Uh, if I had known what the alternative was, I would have said, yes, you want it to be done in Dallas, but the alternative is not known. So it is we need to get out of Dallas and we need to get in a secure place, both for the new president, for the first lady, and get the body out of this uh, community. So I think sort of a reasonable decision, uh, and the law has been changed on this. At that time, the federal officials broke the law. Uh, it, uh, murder of the president was not a federal crime. It was a Texas state crime, uh, and Texas should have, been investiga should have investigated, and the body was removed from Texas illegally, but for, I think, probably understandable reasons at the time. You need to get his attention. Is it your opinion um, that there are uh, 
institutions operating today or people alive today who either through your, during your inquiry or thereafter have been um, trying to keep the truth, whatever it might be, from becoming known? Um, sort of in a, in a major way, no, I don't think so. In a minor way, which others might think is a major way, Yes. So one person whom I interviewed was uh, Richard Helms, former director of Central Intelligence. I had the opinion that he was not telling me anything. Not that he knew what happened with the Kennedy assassination, was trying to keep that secret, but he wasn't going to say anything. And the book, that, the book about him is called The Man Who Kept the Secrets. Uh, I interviewed uh, William Colby, another director of Central Intelligence, I, in fact, I interviewed him a week before he died in a boating accident, uh, which, well, um, uh, <laughs> I had the, the sense with him that he was trying to tell me everything he could about this. Again, not who killed President Kennedy, but to try to explain what was going on uh, in the CIA at the time, what was going on with James Jesus Angleton, the director of counterintelligence of the CIA and the story. Uh, I had an interview with an FBI agent in, uh, in New Orleans, and uh, it's, it's sort of a long story more than we have time for now. I believed he was deliberately lying to me about FBI records on tracking Oswald in New Orleans. Now, I can't prove that, uh, but I had the impression so I went through some records with him, and I was setting him up for a trap. And I got to it, sprang the trap, and okay, this is for me. I'm reading, the, reading body language, which is very, and I'm not good at it anyway. But it was, you found it. And I didn't think you'd find it, but I'm not going to tell you anything. So he, he immediately recognized what the problem was, but he wouldn't tell me anything. Just, well, I don't know. Uh, so I didn't believe him for a minute. Now, I could be wrong, but uh, so there were things like that, but not in terms of any uh, of the larger stories. Uh, years ago, I read the book. I think it was a thousand days. And do you, can you, do you speak know? The microphone? In, um, years ago, I had read the book. Uh, I think it was a thousand days. Um, do you know, in fact, how many people were in the room for the autopsy? Because they did mention about the confusion that was going on during the autopsy, and in fact, they did say that the uh, they never found the brain after. Is that true? Uh, first, it's not in a thousand days because uh, that's Arthur Schlesinger's, and he okay, doesn't talk so. about that. Uh, there is there is a question about how many people were in the autopsy room. If you've seen the movie JFK, let me. If I can just take one second on will be more than a second, on JFK, it is, for a movie, it is a, because he, he has the autopsy scene in, in the film, that's why I'm making this reference to it. It is a fabulous uh, movie in terms of technical skill, in terms of telling a dramatic story. Fabulous movie. And portions of the movie, in my opinion, are historically absolutely correct and show, in my opinion, some of the problems with the Warren Commission. The two witnesses that he uses most for his film, Jim Garrison and Fletcher Prouty, who's Mr. X in the film, are, in my opinion, totally unreliable. Uh, both of them are deceased, so I guess I can't be sued for anything. <laughs> but I would think of saying something that I could be sued for if they were alive. I find them to be totally unreliable. And Oliver Stone bought their stories hook, line, and sinker. Um, I took the de deposition of Fletcher Prouty. Uh, and he's, the again, Donald Sutherland character, Mr. X, in the film. And so I had his, his contemporaneous records there. And he would say, yes, I wrote memos on this. He didn't write memos on it. He just made it up. And I don't know why he um, did that. He's actually one person who I think was lying um, uh, to me. Anyway, in, now getting back to this, in the, in the film uh, uh, JFK, uh, Oliver Stone shows the autopsy scene, and it is so well done that I, I mean, I knew that that wasn't the case, but 
what, was there a video of this uh, event that was going on? And, and if you watch the film, he, he skillfully blends actual archival footage with things that he makes up. And so he'll have a sort of a faded color from 1963, and then he'll do his, that is an actual uh, film, and then he blends that with something that he's made up. If you know what's real and what's not real, you can see what he's doing. If you don't know, it's, it just blends this thing. So he shows the autopsy. Uh, scene and a lot of people's perception of it comes from uh, the JFK uh, film where there would be, I didn't count from the film, but something like 30 people including generals and people from the CIA who were there and question is who's running this autopsy and others. I asked each of the doctors when I took their depositions how many people were there, who were in charge, uh, and although I'm very suspicious on many things about the doctors, and what they did during the autopsy, and I've already hinted at that. I'm not so, I'm not, I don't share the Oliver Stone version. I don't think there were that many there. There was not anybody there giving orders on what should be done or what should not be done. I think the two doctors who were principally running it were simply incompetent. I assume they're great doctors, but they're not forensic pathologists. They couldn't do uh, what they were doing. Uh, the Secretary of the Navy was president, or present uh, Arlie Burke was was there, uh, so he's ultimately their commanding officer. Uh, up on the 17th floor of uh, uh, Bethesda Hospital, uh, Jackie Kennedy is there with the Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, and Robert McNamara calls the autopsy room, when is this going to be over? So they, these two doctors are feeling pressure. Arlie Burke was President Kennedy's personal physician. I don't know anymore, I'm mixing these up. Um, Whatever he was, that's what he was. I'm not trying to change uh, history. But they were, under, they were under pressure, get the autopsy finished by commanding officers, but not someone saying do this or don't do that during uh, the autopsy. Does that answer the question? Do they have the brain? Oh, the brain. Um, well, I can tell you what I think happened. The brain is missing. Uh, the brain has been missing uh, since at least 1967. Uh, one of the I don't know if we want to go into this. Uh, I believe that there is compelling evidence that, in fact, two separate, I don't know what, should, two separate brain autopsies were taking place. So uh, typically what will happen is after the brain is removed during the, type of the, during the time of the autopsy, particularly if it's a gunshot wound to the head, uh, the brain will be taken, put into formalin. It will be allowed to set. I don't know whether this is gruesome or not. Uh, uh, and typically, from what I understand, something like 10 days or something, at that point, the brain will be sectioned, cut into slices, uh, where you'd be able to tra track the trajectory of a bullet. Uh, there's pretty good evidence that there was a supplemental autopsy that was performed the day after, or two days after the original autopsy, and other set of records that there was a uh, supplemental, called supplemental brain autopsy, performed about 10 days later. And his brain could not have done this twice. Uh, my own guess is, and this is purely guess, I mean, I have, I can make, it's not, I just, it's not that I dreamed it, but the best explanation that I can see is that Bobby Kennedy told, uh, told uh, the uh, uh, Bethesda that he wanted his brother's brain to be buried with his brother. Uh, and so that my guess is the brain is in fact in the casket in Arlington Cemetery. There, I mean, there's, there's a longer argument, but that's speculation. The only way to know would be as if the body were exhumed and that, and whether the brain is there or not. But it hasn't been seen since that time. Um. Hi. Um, Hi. I heard on NPR Yesterday, I heard somebody talking about how Kennedy had gotten to a point where he had decided he shouldn't be holding Castro as his uh, mortal enemy, and that he had McGeorge Bundy, who was his Secretary of State, I think, and some woman who was a journalist were working behind the scenes to try to reconcile Kennedy and Castro some, and that... Um, I mean, I can't, I'm sorry, I don't remember much about it. I bet you other people Was heard this, this Peter too. Peter Cornblue? Uh, maybe, I don't. So I have not, I've heard about this, but, who, sorry? Who was 
Yeah, the journalist, that's right, her name was something okay. Howard. Right. But, um, and she apparently was Upper East Side, New York, and she had all these cocktail parties and got these people together sort of in social, but that Kennedy was really trying to uh, reconcile some with Castro, and this guy said it was ironic that, of course, if indeed um, uh, Lee Harvey Oswald was trying to kill him because of because he was trying to defend Castro, and that Castro was trying to um, also to reconcile with Kennedy. But he also said that um, the CIA was completely opposed to whatever uh, Bundy and Kennedy and this woman were doing. So I didn't know, that seems sort of suddenly that brings the CIA back in as a so sort of like, there's no way they would have allowed him to reconcile with Castro, was the I, I know a little bit about the background with Kennedy, over, beginning of overtures, uh, and Kennedy's doing exactly, well, not exactly, but a similar thing in Vietnam, not in terms of reconciling with Ho Chi Minh, I don't mean uh, that, but Kennedy uh, did have a plan to start withdrawing troops uh, December of 1963, though... Uh, whether he, in fact, would have done that or not is something like speculation. If you were Fidel Castro in 1963, you certainly would think that Kennedy is trying to kill you. Uh, so you might also think it would be nice if we could reconcile so he won't kill me anymore. Uh, but uh, that may have been taking place, but it was not uh, changing the immediate situation. And as far as I know, Bobby Kennedy was still trying to kill Castro in, uh, uh, in 1963. What possible motive did Jack Ruby have for uh, killing Oswald, and did your investigation develop any leads into that? We didn't really do anything with uh, Jack Ruby, uh, and it was largely for the reason that we couldn't find really anything additional that could be done in terms of collecting and identifying records. So we asked people, what did you think about something, sort of going for eyewitness testimony, eyewitness testimony being not particularly reliable 30 minutes after the event, 30 years after the event, it's not going to be reliable at all. So we tried to, to the extent we were interviewing witnesses, it was related to correcting, uh, supplementing the documentary record. So we didn't really do anything with, uh, with Jack Ruby. Uh, in terms of what was he thinking, what was he doing, uh, there are some people who will say the key to the Kennedy assassination is Jack Ruby. Uh, and uh, so uh, my predecessor uh, from, on the House Select Committee on Assassinations, um, the general counsel for that entity, believed that's the key to the assassination. Uh, to me, that's, uh, that may be a key to the assassination, but it may be something uh, different. Why he did it... Uh, there is uh, speculation about that, whether he knew Oswald or not. There are curious eyewitnesses who said that they had seen them uh, together or not. The story that Jack Ruby gave, I find not to be particularly believable, uh, but the stories that people attribute to Jack Ruby, I find not to be uh, believable as well. That's not a very helpful answer, but <laughs> that, that's all I have. Yeah, I just was wondering, in all your research, have you ever seen any documents or spoken to anyone who've explained uh, whether or not Oswald was debriefed when he returned from his defection to Russia? And, I mean, just that, I guess that's my only question. Thanks. No, I, we pursued that particular issue. Uh, we pursued it in CIA records. So there's a, a domestic division in CIA whose responsibility would be to brief uh, people returning from the Soviet Union. So there would be tourists who would go to the Soviet Union, uh, take photographs of Red Square. When they came back to the United States, CIA, not always, but would frequently uh, debrief them. Uh, we were not able to find any record that the CIA had done that, uh, which I find to be difficult to believe. In June of 1962, when Oswald returned, uh, one of the headlines in American papers at that time was two recent defectors from the National Security Agency to the Soviet Union. So Congress was holding hearings on defectors from the United States to the Soviet Union, and while Congress is very upset about this issue, a genuine defector to the Soviet Union returns uh, married to a Russian uh, citizen uh, whose... Uh, 
her she was an orphan. She lived with her uncle, who was a member, who was in Soviet intelligence. So Marina Prusakova uh, certainly had curious connections. Now, she's only 17 years old at the time, so she's not uh, a sophisticated person. Um, I spoke um, later with uh, Oleg Kalugin, uh, who later wa who was a, actually a, a KGB spy in the United States in 1963. Uh, he later became head of counterintelligence uh, for the KGB later. And I asked him, you know, what's this deal with Marina being able to come back with Oswald? Uh, what's going on? And he said that he did not know himself uh, based on looking at records, but he said first time he heard the story, she is, he assumed that she was a Soviet plant. Uh, now, she's 17 years old, so this is not a major uh, spy, but this is a sleeper who will be contacted later by the Soviet Union. He said that was his assumption at the time. Now, if Oleg Kalugin can figure that out, the CIA can figure that out, the FBI can figure that out, that they, we've got a genuine defector to the Soviet Union, someone who renounced his citizenship, someone who said that he was going to tell the Soviet Union what he had learned while he was in the Marines, uh, and... Uh, CIA doesn't interview him. By the way, uh, if you don't know, uh, Oswald was a radar operator at Atsugi base in Japan. Atsugi is where U-2 flights flew over the Soviet Union. So there's Oswald, a radar operator, watching planes fly higher and faster than anything that is uh, publicly acknowledged at the time. So he does have this inform he does have some information about this. Uh, and he defects to the Soviet Union, says that he's going to say it, and he comes back and he is not interviewed by the CIA by anything we could find. The FBI Dallas office interviewed him and they said they found Oswald to be very uncooperative. So this defector, Soviet wife, speaks Russian to his wife, uncooperative. What does the FBI do with a genuine defector to the Soviet Union? The FBI closed the file on Oswald. Um, I saw other FBI records where a professor had made a speech saying that we should have better relations with the Soviet Union, uh, and the FBI opened a file on that person uh, making that statement, but closes the one on the defector. Uh, it's, it's not uh, explicable. There was one person who did meet with Oswald, uh, and I'm forgetting his name right now, but I know it. It's somewhere back there. Um, Um, who worked for something like, uh, he worked for some kind of uh, uh, entity that did, uh, uh, dealt with uh, people returning to the United States or people who had newly arrived. And one of the questions, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting his name uh, now. Uh, one of the questions, he taught at Sharpsburg, uh, if that helps anybody else remember his name. Uh, uh, he, um, uh, he was believed maybe he was a CIA officer who secretly debriefed Oswald. We pursued that particular lead. Uh, so he did meet with Oswald when he came back, but we were not able to find any CIA uh, ties to him. So it seems as though CIA did not interview him. Office of Naval Intelligence did not uh, interview him. FBI did, but then closed the file. You mentioned that uh, the person who took the photographs that you interviewed and those photographs that who developed the who photographs. developed the photographs. Did you ever find, or were you ever able to find, which the photographs that she developed? No. No, we we pursued this. Uh, here's one of the one of the questions. So there, there's no massive headwind. We we got the original photographs. Those that are in the archives. Uh, through the, the good graces of Kodak, we went to Rochester, New York. That was one time I felt very special. I was whisked through all the security and airports and taken on separate vans. I thought I was a VIP. Uh, we went on the plane first, and we have FBI agents there who are guarding the uh, autopsy photos. We digitized them. We did not. Kodak did. Uh, blew them up so we could look at these images, and by my non-expert eye, the photographs have not been doctored, retouched. Uh, but the question ends up being uh, whether, when those photographs were taken. Uh, and two possibilities. One is before the autopsy, which is what all of the official records say, is the, the photographs were taken before the autopsy began, 
or after the autopsy, after the body had been reconstructed. So Gawler's mortuary reconstructed the body. Observers, and this is in um, William Manchester, this is the first time I read about it, William Manchester's death of a president that said that the body was so well done you could not tell that he had been shot. So very good reconstruction at the mortuary were the photos taken afterwards, and so that after this wound is uh, covered up. Uh, knowing that this is a possibility, when I interviewed the doctors, I asked them, was the body cleaned in any way before the photographs were taken? And they all said no, they described it as being very messy, blood, brain tissue, blood matted. When you look at the photographs of the back of the head, it's all clean and neatly combed. So before or afterwards, uh, and you know, I can't prove any of this, but uh, all of, I mean, for me, the frustrating thing is the Warren Commission could have done this, and the Warren Commission did not do it. 30 years later, you can wonder about this, but you can't uh, really get that. But conceivably, Sandra uh, Spencer developed photographs from the, from, the autopsy, or from the photographs taken before the autopsy, and not those that are taken later, and she sees the ones taken later in the National Archives. Now, uh, that, the evidence seems to point in that direction, but that's also uh, a fair amount of speculation. I can't say I am really confident that happened, is, but I suspect that happened, uh, and it would be nice to know, but I'm not expecting uh, to find out. If sometime we end up finding uh, additional autopsy photographs that show that, uh, then we will maybe know the ones that Sandra Spencer developed. She has, she has since um, died. Uh, when we're dealing with the 50th anniversary, in some ways, this is the last one that the witnesses who were involved will, or some of them are still around, vast number who were involved uh, are no longer uh, with us, uh, but this will be the last uh, major uh, inquiry, I think. Question back here. My question relates to the, um, on the CBS Evening News, I believe one evening this week, they had, I believe he was the chief surgical resident who was in Parkland in the trauma room or the chief neurosurgical resident. And he was saying that when the body came in and they took the clothes off because of Jack's problems with his back and his spine, he was basically in like a metal corset yes. that braced his spine, but also basically covered his body from the upper chest all the way down. And because of that, when he was hit with the, with the second bullet that came through up through the throat and neck area, normally the body would have crumpled forward if the shot was coming from behind but because of that brace, it held the body up erect, and therefore, when he reviewed the films from Zapruder, the body wasn't able to go forward, it was held up, and therefore the second bullet, because of the position of the head being upright instead of down, could possibly have led to that second mortal wound. I was just wondering if you could talk about that, your thoughts. Uh, if, if I'm understanding, um correctly, uh, first shot, he normally would have crumpled, what you're saying is he normally would have crumpled, uh, but the, the body brace is holding him up, and that's what keeps him visible for the second shot. That's entirely uh, possible. That, of course, being a, a completely separate question from uh, whether the shot to the throat is from the front or from behind, as well as a separate question from uh, the direction the body goes after the head shot which I don't see a brace would have any effect on that at all, but it may have kept him up. And, and uh, though when you, and I'm not a doctor, so I can't say, and that may be a perfectly good explanation. When you see President Kennedy, when you first know that he is hit, his arms go up like this, uh, which uh, suggests, I mean, that his spine is erect completely separately from the body brace, but, but I don't know, and so I can't. Hi. I'm just back to the CIA. I wondered if you could speak to sort of the shades of gray between um, what we see as conspiracy, what we might see as negligence, and what we might see as, you know, bureaucratic ass covering 
in Mexico City um, on the front line thing I saw last week, they talked about they, the CIA had the embassy staked out for years before and after this incident. And when it came out that they had no record, supposedly, of Oswald even going to that embassy, um, everyone's like, oh, well, that's conspiracy. Well, it seems clear, or it was supported by this program, that you know, they knew he had been there once the president had been killed. And then when they have, or they're holding images of this guy, they got rid of the images. So that's not conspiracy to kill the president, but that is conspiracy to cover up you know, something that they may have missed. And I wonder if you could talk about those shades with the CIA. One, one of the fascinating parts of the story is what happened in Mexico City. So seven weeks before the assassination, uh, I'll put in quotation marks, Oswald goes to uh, Mexico City. The, uh, the CIA has staked out both the Cuban and the Soviet embassies, as well as maybe some other embassies there that will just maybe other embassies, but at least those two, because those have been declassified uh, now. And the CIA has both tapped the telephones, not all of the telephones there, and there's sometimes misleading statements about that, but they had tapped some of the telephones to the Cuban and Soviet embassy, not all of them, and they also had photo surveillance. So in theory, anyone going in or out of the embassy would be, someone going into the embassy would be photographed probably the back of the head. Coming out of the embassy, they would get the photograph from the front of the head, or from, from, the, from the face. So Oswald, I think, went in or out of the Cuban and Soviet embassies seven times, I think. Don't quote me on that. I think about seven times. In, so in theory, the CIA would have 14 photographs of Oswald uh, seven of his back and seven of his front. Or if it's five, then ten. You get the, I, get the idea. Uh, after the assassination, uh, CIA was aware that there was somebody claiming to be Oswald going to the so Soviet and Cuban embassies. And I'll say something else about that. And so CIA was asked to send photograph of Oswald after the assassination. I talked with the woman who sent the photograph. Her name is Ann Goodpasture. She also has uh, passed away. Uh, since this uh, time, and she said she was very opposed to sending this photograph because she said she didn't know whether it was Oswald or not in the photograph. If you look at the photograph, uh, it looks to me like what I would say a Ukrainian sailor, uh, nothing that looks anything like Oswald. So there should have been, in theory, 14. One of the things I wanted to find out was uh, what was going on with the photo surveillance. So I got all of the original records from photo surveillance to see what is going on. CIA had said, well, it wasn't working during the part of the time that Oswald was there. So I looked at their monthly report. And in, uh, in October, as I'm recalling, something like October 30th, this is before the assassination, they filed their monthly report with headquarters. They didn't say anything about photo surveillance not working. It was only after the assassination that they said it wasn't working, a story that I found not to be entirely uh, credible. There's also the very curious story of uh, the, the taping of Oswald. So uh, there's a um, uh, CIA, again, has uh, uh, conducting wiretaps. And what CIA would do, and this is Ann Goodpaster, again, became the source of this, CIA would have the large reel-to-reel -reel tapes uh, where they would record all conversations going in and out of the Soviet and Cuban embassies on those lines that they had uh, tapped. Then they would go back and listen to them. And anything, well, I don't want to get ahead of myself there. So they, they're conducting this. After the assassination, the CIA is asked, please let us hear these tape recordings of Oswald calling the uh, Soviet embassy. And the CIA said those tapes had been routinely erased. So we don't have them. We don't have them. Uh, so we don't know if it's Oswald's voice of this person. So we don't have the tapes anymore. Well, on November 23rd, 1963, the day after the assassination, uh, we do have this recording of uh, President Johnson and J. Edgar Hoover, whom Johnson called Edgar. Uh, so there is this recording, and Johnson says, so what, is this, what is this business about Oswald in Mexico City? And Hoover says, that's something we don't understand. We have up here the tape, and it's not Oswald's voice. So uh, this tape existed after the assassination, not routinely erased. So I asked Anne Goodpasture about this, what about this tape? And she said, oh, yes, the reel-to-reel -reel tapes were erased. But when we found something of operational interest, 
uh, then we'd make one of those small tapes. And she said she had that tape in her hand. She gave it to the CIA chief of station, Wynne Scott, and he then took it. She didn't know what happened with it after that point. So now think about this. Uh, heavy surveillance of the Soviet and Cuban embassy. A guy goes down there claiming to be Oswald, goes in and out several times. They don't have any photographs of it. They have a tape recording of this person who claims to be Oswald, but then they lose the tape recording, and J. Edgar Hoover says it's not Oswald's voice. All of this suggesting to, I think, any reasonable uh, interpretation, at least the possibility, someone is imitating Oswald in Mexico City, and CIA may not know that, that somebody's impersonating Oswald. They may not know that, but they have this information. After the assassination, if it turns out you now have this uh, no, lone nut, this crazy gunman, this Marxist who's going in and out of the Soviet and Cuban embassies under CIA surveillance, uh, and he's including meeting with Kostikov, uh, the head of assassinations, as I mentioned, CIA looks pretty inept that they didn't do something about this, so an attempt to suppress this. Not because they were involved in the assassination, but because Oswald went through their security net, which is designed to catch things like this, and they utterly failed to do that. The story is even more involved than that, but you have both photo surveillance and electronic surveillance. Oswald should have been on it. There's no evidence that, in fact, the Lee Harvey Oswald accused of assassinating the president was the person who was picked up by CIA. Hello. Um, I find it curious that so many persons, professional persons, would change their story, i.e. the doctor who uh, 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 not be forthcoming with information. Do you feel like those persons were directed to, to not talk about this by uh, a government agency or by, I mean, what, how do you account for this um, changing of the story or being very hesitant to talk about uh, what they observed personally? Uh, those who would be, um whom you might say changed their story would be the doctors who treated President Kennedy at Parkland Hospital, not the doctors who performed the autopsy, whom I think probably changed the story a little bit, and that has to do with the autopsy notes, but, but, they, but that was something that happened on November uh, 22nd, not something that happened uh, several weeks uh, later. Uh, I did ask about this, of whether they had, whether any of them, whether it's the doctors in Parkland or in Bethesda, had ever been told what to do or what to say, and they all said consistently, nobody ever told me what uh, to say. And I don't personally have any reason to believe that anyone did tell them uh, what to say. So how do we account for some of the doctors changing from saying, uh, we believe Kennedy was shot from the front to we believe Kennedy was shot from uh, behind? Uh, one doctor in Dallas, um, uh, a neurologist, McClelland, uh, did not change his story. And he was very critical of his fellow doctors who did change their story. And this is you know, a small community. You're all working at the same hospital. You don't want to uh, say too much about this. Uh, but he was very critical of his fellow doctors, and he did uh, keep the story. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what the answer is. Um, no evidence that I've seen that they were pressured to change the story. The most likely human explanation that I can think of, and I say this without any particular uh, insight in psychology any more than anybody else here, is they ended up believing the official version and they assumed that they were mistaken. And they probably genuinely assumed that they were uh, mistaken. That's my, that's my guess. But one, you, one, you can all answer the same question yourselves. One final question. First, I want to say thank you so much for such an in interesting presentation tonight. And thanks, Anwar and you and E for bringing you here with us tonight. My question is, based on all of your experience and investigation in the case, are you able to share with us what you think um, is the most compelling evidence on who killed Kennedy? 
Is that a good way to end? <laughs> I tried to put that one aside. I didn't, I didn't uh, succeed. L let me say it this way. I don't know who killed President Kennedy. Uh, if, uh, I think there is no, if we differentiated between circumstantial evidence, sort of s some backgrounds, who's in which place at which time, we differentiate between circumstantial evidence and direct evidence, saying I saw someone pick up the rifle and shoot. Uh, if we differentiate between those, there's no direct evidence on anybody for the Kennedy assassination. It's a circumstantial uh, case. And whether you believe it that it was Castro or anti-Castro or mafia or CIA, you have to make your case based on circumstantial evidence. And that's not shocking or new or uh, immoral. That's what legal cases often are. You, when you don't have direct evidence, you have to put the circumstances together and try and find the most plausible uh, explanation. Uh, if we actually ask the question, was Oswald guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, assuming that we apply legal standards at the time, suppose that Oswald had lived, the judge had uh, applied uh, evidentiary rules appropriately, that he had instructed the jury, he, maybe the judge was a she, that's possible. No, Dallas, no. When he, <laughs> uh, when he uh, uh, if he made those decisions, instructed the jury correctly, uh, and the jury made a correct decision, not based on emotion, but the evidence, I am convinced that Oswald would have been found not guilty by, beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, to me, there's just no question he is not guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. That doesn't mean he didn't do it, uh, but it means that the evidence was not there. Key pieces of evidence were, uh, for in legal terms, their chain of custody had been lost. So somebody says, somebody gave it to me, and that person says, I didn't give it to him. And their just chain of custody is a uh, serious problem throughout the entire Kennedy assassination, whether it's the Manlicher Carcano, whether it's the uh, ballistics and others. So the evidence is not there. Uh, and so you can have a circumstantial case, and there is some uh, inculpatory evidence, some pretty good evidence that Oswald knew something was going on. Immediately after the assassination, he learns the president's killed. He doesn't sit around Dealey Plaza looking and trying to find people. He tries to get out there. He immediately goes home, and he gets a gun. Uh, now, that's not if I heard of somebody being assassinated, that would not be my uh, reaction. So I assume, uh, and there are many other things, that he knew about something that was going on. Now, maybe he knew that he had just killed the president, or maybe he thought s somebody asked him to be in the lunchroom during the time of the assassination, and he realized he was going to be framed for it, so he's going to defend, protect his life. But he knew something was going on. There, there is something there. He's not completely innocent. Uh, that is completely innocent of knowing something that's going on. I can't see any plausible explanation for that. So even with the circumstantial case, it's not sufficient to convince Oswald. But if you say, against whom else is there a circumstantial case, there isn't anybody for whom you have even a plausible circumstantial case. So you can say, well, CIA, or maybe there's some marksman. You don't have them there in Dallas with people seeing it. So you go from a very and uh, a significant amount of evidence in a circumstantial case against Oswald, but not enough to convict him, but nothing against any other uh, person. So, I don't know, 40% Oswald did it, 60% someone else, and who knows who that was, and I can't even name one person with 1% plausibility. Thank you.